Today we are looking at a case from the late 19th century. So sit back as we go to Australia. Louisa Collins was born on the 11th of August, 1847, in Beltries, very close to the small town of Scone in New South Wales, Australia. Her father, Henry, was originally from Birmingham in England and had been sent by the British courts to Australia in 1831. He left Portsmouth on the 16th of October on board the ship Asia and along with 200 other men was transported to Australia to serve his punishment, arriving in Sydney on the 3rd of February, 1832. Once his punishment was over, he stayed in Australia and married Catherine Ring, who had emigrated from Ireland with her family. When Louisa was 14 years old, her parents sent her to work as a domestic servant for a wealthy solicitor in the town of Merriwar. She worked hard and was treated well by her employer. She had always been a pretty child with long dark hair, and as she got older, she realized that men would pay her a lot of attention. This was something she found to be quite amusing and developed a very flirtatious nature. There were many men who wanted to court her, but when she was 18 years old, on the advice of her mother, she married Charles Andrews. He was well known in the community as he had worked for a long time as a butcher. Louisa's mother considered this to be a respectable match as he had a steady income and could provide for her daughter. But Louisa was 13 years his junior and while she still liked to dance and have fun, her husband wanted his wife to adopt a more traditional role. Over the next few years, Louisa gave birth to nine children, seven of whom survived infancy. Life was hard for her and she missed the attention and compliments she used to receive from young men and sometimes wished that she could escape from her daily grind of cleaning, washing, cooking and looking after the children. At least her husband could leave the house to go to work. In 1886, the family moved and took up residence in the Sydney suburb of Botany. Charles thought that it would help the family finances if they took in lodgers. The children were older, so could help, but the added workload was difficult for Louisa. Her life had just become one of constant working. Her looks were fading and she felt that life was passing her by. She had taken to drinking brandy and sometimes went to the pub. Although having lodgers in the house was hard, she liked the fact that they noticed her and it didn't take long for her flirtatious nature to reappear. One of the lodgers was a young man named Michael Collins. He was a bold and self-confident character and at every opportunity would try to spend time chatting to Louisa. He would tell her how young she looked and pay her compliments. Although Louisa liked the attention, her husband didn't and considered the young man to be an ungrateful guest. Things came to a head in December 1886 when Charles confronted Michael Collins about the relationship with his wife. A scuffle followed and the young man was evicted from their home. Less than two months later, Louisa's husband, Charles Andrews, became ill. He suffered from terrible stomach pains and was attended by a doctor named Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin was unsure exactly what was causing the sickness. He examined the patient and discussed his daily routine and his diet. He gave him medicine and said that he would call back in a few days. But Charles did not recover and passed away on the 2nd of February, 1887. He was 53 years old. As so often was the case in the late 19th century, he had insured his life and Louisa was the beneficiary of a small insurance policy. The circumstances surrounding his death were not considered suspicious and Dr. Martin registered the death as due to gastritis. Louisa, however, was not a grieving widow. She was known to have told people that she found her husband to be a serious and somewhat boring character with little time for fun and laughter. And after his death, neighbors were a little shocked. She did not dress herself in black and did not seem to mourn her husband's passing. Instead, she drank and went dancing with the man who had previously been lodging in her house, Michael Collins. On the 9th of April, 1887, just two months after Charles died, 39-year-old Louisa Andrews and 23-year-old Michael Collins 
were married. On her wedding day, she was four months pregnant with his child. They lived together in Popples Terrace, Botany Road, in the Sydney suburb of Botany. Towards the end of 1887, Louisa gave birth to their child, a boy who they named John. Everything was going well until on the 10th of April, 1888, the baby who was now four and a half months old became ill. They tried to nurse him, but by 10 p.m. he was continually crying. He was comforted by his mother and then eventually fell asleep. But he awoke an hour later, screaming and seemingly in a lot of pain, although neither of his parents considered calling for a doctor. Shortly before midnight, baby John died. When the doctor came to register the death, he questioned Louisa and Michael about the circumstances of the baby's demise. Louisa told him that he had been ill for two days and they had given him small amounts of castor oil, but his condition didn't improve. Dr. Martin was a doctor who had visited Louisa's first husband when he became ill and subsequently died. So as the death of her baby was so soon after, he instructed the couple to report the death to the police. He said that he would send a letter to the city coroner. At the time, the mortality rate in children under five years old in Australia was 19%. So the death of a baby was not uncommon. The coroner concluded that as there was no suspicious circumstances involved, it could be presumed that baby John Collins had died from natural causes and it would not be necessary to hold an inquest. Louisa continued her daily routine of chores and looking after the five children that still resided in the house at Popples Terrace. Michael returned to work as a wool washer but soon started to feel unwell. A doctor named Dr. Marshall was called to examine him. He found his patient's symptoms somewhat curious and found it difficult to ascertain exactly what was causing Michael's illness. He visited the house a few times over the next two months until on the 3rd of July, 1888, Michael's condition suddenly deteriorated. Dr. Marshall observed that Louisa was trying to comfort her husband but he also noticed that she had been drinking. The following day, the 4th of July, when the doctor arrived at the house to check on his patient, he collected samples of urine and vomit. He also took a bottle of brandy and a medicine container that he found next to the bed. He conducted a rough analysis, but found nothing suspicious. Four days later, on the 8th of July, Michael Collins died. Dr. Marshall informed Louisa that he was unable to issue a death certificate due to the circumstances of the death and would have to send a report to the city coroner. On receiving the report from Dr. Marshall and the fact that Louisa's first husband had also died quite suddenly, the coroner opened an inquest into the death of Michael Collins. At the inquest, evidence was presented confirming that the deceased received quite a few visitors in the weeks preceding his death. Many of these were concerned neighbours who called to assist Louisa. Dr. Marshall informed the inquest that he had asked Louisa to take Michael to hospital, but she replied that it would be better that he die at home. Dr. Marshall told her that he would be well cared for and there was no reason for him to die, but Louisa would not contemplate the notion. Half an hour after Michael's death, Constable Jeffers had arrived at the house and searched the property. He found a part filled glass by the bed of a deceased. Its contents had been analysed and found to contain traces of arsenic. With this, the coroner concluded that the death of Michael Collins could be considered suspicious. The inquest had established that based on the symptoms of the illness and the results of the autopsy, the deceased had died from arsenic poisoning, possibly administered by his wife. On Saturday the 14th of July, 1888, the coroner opened a second inquest and issued a warrant to exhume the bodies of Charles Andrews and baby John Collins. Examinations found that the body of Charles Andrews contained faint traces of arsenic, but there were no traces found in the body of the child. The coroner decided that there was enough evidence to presume that both Charles Andrews and Michael Collins had been killed by arsenic poisoning and Louisa Collins was charged with murder. The trial of Louisa Collins opened at the Supreme Court of New South Wales on the 6th of August, 
1888, the prosecution had decided to only charge her with the murder of her second husband, Michael Collins. Witnesses confirmed that she had nursed Michael, but had been drinking while doing so. Some told the court that although she cared for him, it felt that she was indifferent to his needs and sometimes seemed to be unemotional and somewhat detached. Dr. Marshall said that although Mrs. Collins refused to take her husband to hospital, the reluctance to take poorly relatives to hospital was not uncommon. He also said that although sometimes she seemed distant, on other occasions she was very caring and attentive towards her husband. He added that although he had initially thought that the deceased had died from gastritis, now he understands that arsenic was found in his body. He was sure that poisoning was the cause of death. In fact, two grams of arsenic was found in the body and arsenic was also discovered in his vomit. Louisa had always maintained that she did not have any arsenic and all she had given her husband was vomiting powder that she had bought from the local chemist in Botany Roads. When the police visited the chemist, they were able to confirm this to be true and any arsenic they had sold was traced and accounted for, none of which led back to Louisa. The prosecution called Louisa's daughter to the stand. Her name was May and she was only 11 years old. She testified that her mother kept a box of rough on rats in the kitchen. This was an arsenic based poison used to kill unwanted rodents and commonplace in houses in the late 19th century. The defence reminded the court that Michael Collins did not have a life insurance policy, so in no way would Louisa benefit from his death. They also stated that the deceased worked in the wool washing industry, where workers could be exposed to arsenic. He was also taking some medication for a lump on his groin, and this may have contained arsenic, or he could have added some himself. The defence did manage to put an element of doubt into the case against Louisa. The prosecution continued to argue that the defendant was a ruthless woman, known as the Borgia of Botany Bay. They reminded the court that she had had an affair with the deceased when he had been a boarder in the family home she shared with her children and her first husband, who had also died in mysterious circumstances. She then married Michael Collins shortly after, before ridding herself of him when she lost interest in the marriage. When the trial ended, the judge did his summing up and the jury retired to consider the case. Three and a half hours later, they returned and told the judge that they could not agree on a verdict. The judge asked them to go back and reconsider. On Thursday the 9th of August 1888, they again returned and the foreman informed the court that there was no possibility of an agreement as they were split on the verdict. The judge then dismissed the jury. Three months later, on the 5th of November, the second trial of Louisa Collins began. The same evidence was heard, but once again, the jury was split and unable to reach a verdict. When a jury was unable to reach a verdict after two trials, it was usual practice that the case against the defendant be dropped, but it was decided by the New South Wales courts that Louisa Collins should stand trial for the murder of her first husband, Charles Andrews. This trial commenced at the end of November. The prosecution told the court how after marrying the deceased at 18 years old and having nine children, she grew tired of him when she met the young man, Michael Collins, who was lodging at their property. But when her husband ejected him from their house and forbade his wife from seeing him, the defendant callously poisoned him. The defense, however, explained that the deceased would have had exposure to arsenic during his life and after being buried, it was possible that arsenic may have entered his body through the soil or the coffin. They announced that it was impossible to establish beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant was responsible for her husband's death. When both the prosecution and the defence had presented their case, the jury were sent out to deliberate. But just like the previous two trials, they are unable to agree a verdict. Louisa Collins had now been tried three times, twice for the murder of her second husband, Michael Collins, and once for the murder of her first husband, Charles Andrews, and each one had resulted in a hung jury. The case had been widely reported in the newspapers, and just like the three juries 
the public sentiment was also split on whether she was guilty of her crimes. After the third trial, it was presumed that Louisa Collins would be released. Remarkably, however, a fourth trial was ordered, and this time she would again be prosecuted for the poisoning of her second husband, Michael Collins. The fourth trial of Louisa Collins commenced on the 6th of December, 1888, at the Central Criminal Court in Sydney, and followed the same format as the previous ones, with testimony from the same witnesses. However, this time the prosecution were able to establish that the company where the deceased had worked did not use arsenic in their everyday activities, so Michael Collins would not have come into contact with the poison at his workplace. At 12pm on Saturday the 8th of December 1888, the judge summed up the case, and the jury then retired to consider the verdict. Two hours later, they returned, and when the judge asked if they found the defendant guilty or not guilty, the jury foreman replied, guilty. There was a gasp in the courtroom before the judge turned to the defendant and asked if she had anything to say. She replied that she did not. The judge then sentenced Louisa Collins to death by hanging. The newspapers and the people of New South Wales seemed divided on the verdict, but most agreed that it was somewhat inevitable that the court would eventually find Louisa guilty. Some newspapers pointed out but after three trials, in which a total of 36 men had heard the case and were unable to reach a verdict, it seemed unfair that she should be hanged. They considered that any evidence pointing to her guilt was circumstantial. The state government had been able to throw unlimited resources at the case, whereas the defendant had been unable to pay for her own legal counsel and was represented in each trial by a defence team who did not receive any payment. Just before Christmas, Sir Ninian Melville stood up in the New South Wales Parliament, expressing his concerns over the sentence. This started a debate in the chamber, but the law stated that the crime for murder was punishable by death, and Mrs Collins had been found guilty of that crime. So unless there was a change in the law, she would be hanged. The case still fascinated the public, and the newspapers continued to print stories about the trial and the evidence involved. It was suggested that Louisa's children had been guided by the prosecution about what to say on the witness stand. At the first trial, her teenage son had told the court that he could not recall any occasion that he had seen his parents arguing. But his testimony changed in the fourth trial when he stated that they had sometimes argued when his mother drank. The one thing that people struggled to understand was that the life of Michael Collins was not insured. So Louisa had no motive to poison him and had no financial gain by his death. The prosecution had also never been able to provide any evidence that she had ever purchased any arsenic other than the box of rough on rats that like so many people at the time, she kept in the kitchen. Louisa always denied poisoning her husbands and believed that after being tried four times, she would be reprieved and her sentence commuted but on the 8th of January, 1889, Louisa Collins was hanged at Darlinghurst Prison. She was 41 years old and the last woman to be hanged in the Australian state of New South Wales. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.